I started working in the uh, visual effects part of the film industry pretty much by accident. I uh, was working in film to support my studio work as an artist. So I'd work periodically on film and then periodically as an artist and go back to my studio, make enough money on a movie to go to my studio and work for a period of time without being having to earn a living. And then when I got broke, I would go back on a movie. And the problem was I so loved working on films that uh, when I got back to my studio, I didn't like it. So I found myself working more and more on films and what I thought I just what I started out doing, for the most part, was being involved with miniatures, and miniature photography, and building miniatures, that sort of thing. And that just led naturally to, you know, optical effects and blue screen technology and, and other things that I started to pick up and learn. And, uh, and I enjoyed it so much, I just loved it, it was the perfect combination for me all the creative stuff I'd been doing, plus the technical stuff that I loved, and um, that's how I got involved in the film business. I got involved in the film business because I really liked doing what I was doing. Um, well, you know, I was a minor player in Blade Runner. I was a, just another crew member, like so many people. Um, I just happen to be associated with a few props that are sort of signature props in a movie. My credit was action prop supervisor, but really essentially I was an art director. It's just that I wasn't in the art director's local, so they couldn't give me a credit as an art director. So the producers invented this title for me called action prop supervisor. I've never seen that before and I've never seen it since and I have no idea. I didn't know until I saw the movie that's what the credit was going to be, but that's what it was. And, uh, and I immediately became responsible for uh, getting s props like the Void Kampf machine and the interior of all the cars and miscellaneous props throughout the movie. The, the Esper machine that, that Harrison Ford uses to navigate through that photograph to find um, uh, Zora, Zora? I can't remember her name. The dancer, you know, Joanna Cassidy. That's, that's her real name, but the character's name, I'm not sure about. Um, and um, that was great fun. I had a small crew, about 12 people. The first project was the Void Comp Machine, which was a, an emergency because the first group that had tried to build it essentially failed. And the, I got recruited to put a team together. And luckily, I was able to hook up with a friend of mine, Mark Stetson. And, and Mark's had a group of miniature builders ready to go, and we jumped in and worked around the clock for a few days and got the prop done and delivered it to the set. And then immediately we got involved in finishing the inside of the spinner and doing the same thing. And I worked nine days without sleep, and so did my crew. Um, and then we were all on the set hallucinating and trying to figure out how to survive through the day because we were so tired. Um, but we really enjoyed it. It was fun. So that's what I did on Blade Runner. I, I went from one exercise of design and execution to another, you know. And uh, the, the concept sketches that we were working from were Sid Mead's. The production designer was Larry Paul. Uh, Larry was doing a great job, but quite often he and his art directors just couldn't cover everything. So. So my job was to pick up all the pieces, really, of all the things. They just couldn't, there were just weren't enough people in the art department to do it all. Um, and I had both the construction skills and the artistic skills that they needed and the technical skills. So we were able to put it all together. And some of the, you know, you generally art directors might know how something should look, but they would have no idea how to build it. We didn't have time to filter through that many people, so that's how I got the job. Well, the transition from optical to digital effects 
which all of us, my friends and I, expected to take years, took months. Um, and, I mean, there were aspects of it that took longer. Uh, generally, film titles were done optically for quite a long time into the digital revolution, or whatever you want to call it. And the reason opticals continued to be put together, or titles continued to be put together optically, is they ran for so long. They were four minutes long. And nobody had enough storage for four minutes worth of frames. And they didn't have pipelines fast enough to handle four minutes. You're talking 56, 5,800 frames of material. And in the late 80s, early 90s, that was pretty much impossible to handle a, a one sequence that was that long. Reliably. I mean, you could do it, but, you know, you weren't going to make any money. Um, but I, I, I so embraced it, was so ready for it, and so eager to do it, and I've been involved in digital tests and digital development of different techniques for a very long time. And the, the maps on war games in 82 were all digitally created. They were all computer graphic. Um, there was a fellow named Colin Cantwell, who's a brilliant designer and technical fellow who's, who I had worked with previously um, at Universal Studios. And Colin did the very first digital storyboards I'd ever seen, essentially previs, um, in 1978. And Colin was hired uh, to work on war games before I was, and then I came on, and, and uh, Colin continued to be the designer on the maps and, and, and get the maps done. The thing is, the job grew a lot, and so it couldn't be done just by Colin. We got a lot more people. But, I, I mean, I jumped right in. You know, on war games, we had to build our own film recorders. There were no film recorders that existed to do what we needed to do, so we had to make them. So we made them. Um, I spec them out, and we had people build them, and uh, and they worked. We built three of them, and they worked just fine. Uh, so um, the, the the transition for me was was welcome, very welcome. So that's really all I can say. It's not, it, and it was very easy for me to know where digital technology was going to be useful. Um, and the interesting thing was I started um, Batman Returns, the second Batman movie, the Tim Burton, second of the two Tim Burton movies. And when I started the film, I knew that we were going to be doing some digital compositing, and uh, at that point hadn't been thinking about any creature work. Um, and some digital map paintings and things like that. I knew we were going to be doing some. But for the most part, the film was going to be optical. And I thought we'd probably wind up at the end with about 20% of the movie being done digitally and about 80% being done optically. And in fact, over the length of that movie, it became 80% digital and 20% optical. And it, so that transition from the optical to digital, which we all estimated would take five to ten years, literally took 18 months. And Batman Returns is right in the middle of that. And it culminated the year after the release of Batman Returns, was the release of Jurassic Park. So we had The Abyss in 89. Uh, there was, I think, a Back to the Future in there somewhere. Um, it was Batman Returns, where we created characters, bats and penguins, that unlike dinosaurs, people knew what bats and penguins looked like, so we had to make animals that felt real uh, on a level or in a way that nobody ever tried to achieve before. Um, and I think we were successful, we got nominated, and, uh, uh, but it was... Uh, immensely difficult. It was really difficult. We were down to, I mean, we were counting minutes in terms of how many more frames we could manage to render before we had to literally take the render out of the machine 
and film. That's when we had, we had to deliver a film negative. We didn't deliver a digital file. So, because film, movies were shot on film. And so everything had to be filmed out. So at a certain point, we had to get it onto the film recorder and get the negative to the lab to be processed. Film recorders were essentially crude. So quite often, you would, in a crucial situation, you would take the same file and put it on three film recorders to try to make sure that one of them had a good file that you could actually print. Um, it was exciting. <laughs> it was really hard. <laughs> it was really hard. Well, I really enjoy this job. I mean, there, it used to be, in the optical days, that my favorite part was the planning and the shooting. And my least favorite part was the post-production optical process. And that's because opticals, being an analog process and depending so much on photochemical responses and you know the accuracy of mats, which would grow or shrink over time, depending on the film stock and the length of time it took, or they would get scratched or they get <coughs> Excuse me. Or the elements would get dirty. You know, opticals held less. It, it was wonderful when they worked. It was such a wonderful rush when they worked. So you, but you, but it was really, no matter how good the optical compositor was, who was work, you were working with on that optical printer, and these people were brilliant. Um, you never knew, and they never knew if it really hit it that time. You know, and when you did, you knew it was like capturing lightning in a bottle. So when we went to digital, suddenly a, a level of security came out of knowing that if we have this element, we have that element, and we've done this right, and we've done that right, we're going to be able to put it together. And if it's not quite right, we can make an adjustment to the parts that aren't right without affecting the parts that are, which with opticals was never the case. You could have a beautiful shot in opticals, but have a bad frame because of some dirt or a scratch or something just odd. And you go back in just to fix that one thing and the whole shot falls apart. You know, and that didn't happen digitally. So, I mean, it could if the operator or the compositor didn't know what they were doing, but generally it didn't happen. So, so I, 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 now I really embrace the entire process. Um, I love coming up with the ideas of how we're going to do stuff, what it's going to look like, pitching that to the director, working with the production designer and the DP to get it built and shot. I love that. I love being on set. I love working with the actors. I, you know, it's probably my favorite time. Once we start rolling the camera, I, my wife always tells me I look so happy. You know. Um, but now, when we get into post, if we're doing our job right and the shots start coming together, that's just as much fun. It's a different kind of fun, but it's just as much fun. So I don't really have a, a, an incredibly favorite part, but I, I do really like um, the, the initial stages, just because there's so much hope and you know there's, there's, the opportunities are so rich and the, the field is wide open. And then as you proceed down the path, you're, you're narrowing and converging to the final product. And so your options become less and less. And as you're converging, it's still fun, but then it's more a question of execution and, and being a, a good explainer of things. You know? so. Well, you know, I've been asked that question a lot. Um, and people say, what's your favorite film? Who's your favorite director? What's, what's the thing you remember best about a movie that you've worked on? And uh, I, I really can't, I can't pick one up. Um, every film has its own experience. Um, some films are much more difficult than others because the schedule is tighter or the budget is difficult or the director is difficult or something, you know. 
Um, but that doesn't mean, I mean, that it was, wasn't a great experience. I mean, Blade Runner was, in terms of the hours I worked and the level of exhaustion, was one of the worst experiences I ever had. But as a film, it, and as an experience overall, it ranks at the very top. It was a fantastic experience. I learned more about filmmaking on that movie than any single movie I've worked on since. Um, it just, there's so many things suddenly started to click for me on that film. So that was a great experience. War Games was a great experience. Braveheart was a great experience. Um, Golden Compass certainly was a great experience. Tropic Thunder was huge fun in a silly little movie, really, in every respect, it was a comedy. But it was the only out-and-out, full-on comedy I'd ever worked on. And I, um, I didn't do the shooting part of the film. I wasn't on early. I'd come back from Golden Compass, and uh, Ben Stiller, the director, was looking, and the star of it, um, was looking for a supervisor to take over for Michael Owens, who had been supervising it. Um, and Michael was... At the time Michael took the job, the movie was supposed to be about 100 shots. And he was also working on a Clint Eastwood movie. He does virtually everything Clint Eastwood does. Um, and the Trout Defender grew to 500 shots. And Michael, being involved with two movies, when one of them grows to 500 shots, something's got to give. And Ben started looking around for somebody else to take over. Uh, so Michael went back to work with... Uh, with Clint, and uh, and I took the Trump Thunder job with Ben, um, and it was huge fun because it was funny, and doing funny visual effects is really hard. You know, they say comedy is serious business, and and uh, and it is. And I just learned a huge amount about comic timing. Ben has amazing comic timing, and how choices are made. You know, comedically, which is different. Uh, and the things you think about, and the things you want to do, and the number of options you have to present to the director. When it's a comedy, it's much more difficult to define exactly how the effect is going to play out and become a part of that story and help tell the story and be funny at the same time. And so you do levels of variations of the effect. So, if, for instance, in Tropic Thunder, there's a scene where the Ben Stiller character is being shot and there's like blood coming out. And it's, it's pretty gross. I mean, on the face of it, you read it in the script and go, oh, I don't think this is funny. I don't think this is going to work. In the movie, it turned out to be funny. Um, but we did three versions of those shots for Ben. We had a little bit of blood, which was sort of the realistic version. Then we had a little bit over the top. And then we had crazy silly, you know. And he took, he took those three, said, uh, don't do the realistic version, that's, that's not good. Let's just go over the top. So we went over the top. And it was funny, because it was so stupid. It was really, you know, it was great. And I found out quite often in that film that we, we had to do shots multiple times. Uh, but we present all the options at the same time to Ben, so he could choose. And you could watch them in the cut and say, this one's funny, this one's not, this one's better, this one's not. Um, which drove the artist crazy because I would say, okay, now do one with more blood. <clears throat> make it, make this piece go faster. No, now make it go slower. Now tilt the blade like that. No, tilt the blade like this. Now do it. You know, and so it greatly increased the amount of work that the facility and the artist had to do. But, you know, in the end, it worked out. It was fun. Ben was happy. You know, that's the goal. So, uh, you know, it was just another side of the coin. And uh, it's been a great career. I have no regrets whatsoever.